Okay, it's my pleasure now to introduce our speaker, um, Kala McNamee. Um, she has a very impressive uh, 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 curriculum vitae uh, for uh, someone who received her PhD only two years ago. Um, she did her uh, uh, undergraduate work in uh, anthropology at the University of, uh, of uh, Pittsburgh and also for a time at Grinnell College in uh, Grinnell, Iowa. She then went to the University of, of Calgary where she, in the Department of Archaeology, now fused with anthropology, I have learned, um, uh, where she uh, undertook uh, work uh, relating to geo-archaeological investigations of, of, uh, of uh, a site or uh, an area in northern Arizona. Then for her PhD, uh, she started the um, uh, work that she's now continuing here in Greece, but started first in the American Southwest, uh, relating to uh, soil uh, like the list, um, and um, especially relating to um, um, work with groundstone tools. So that she, she is, uh, uh, for Greece at least, as far as I know, um, is pioneering in this work of um, uh, looking at groundstone tools, looking at the evidence that you can get, and helping in the uh, reconstruction, not just of the dietetic uh, practices, um, um, but also of environmental issues. Uh, at the moment, she is here for three years, right? Three years. We're going to see a lot of that. Uh, as opposed to a doctoral fellow in the um, doctoral research fellow in the Wiener Laboratory at the American School. Um, and she's working on uh, uh, starches and grains, where this is where her topic is, relating to mostly the Bron Bronze Age in, uh, in the mainland, but also she has been telling me all the other places they've been trying to get her to go and look at. It, and I'm sure that will increase as, her, as people learn what she's doing. Um, she has worked in uh, many interesting places, Mexico, uh, uh, with material from Mexico, from Kos on Greece, uh, from um, uh, you know, True, which we're going to learn about, um, also uh, Southwest, uh, the, the Canadian prairies, uh, up in the, uh, in the Arctic. It's, uh, it's amazing uh, uh, for us who uh, only can work in the Mediterranean. We, we are limited. We, we, if it's not Mediterranean, we can't, can't do it. And uh, like many uh, archaeological scientists, they're able to move uh, many, many places. Um, she has also uh, started a very uh, impressive uh, career as a, as a writer publisher. And um, uh, I look forward to keeping in mind some of these, uh, some of these titles that I've seen here for, for projects that I'm interested in. And she is um, well honored as well, so that um, uh, all of this activity has been recognized by uh, not only uh, her mentors and uh, funding organizations, but also, I'm sure, by her peers. So we're very much interested in, um, uh, in hearing the lecture, and I was very much interested in finally meeting her. We've been trying since the fall uh, to, to coincide in the, same, in the same space, and now we have done it. So, Kala, it's yours. Research, which is identifying subsistence practices using starch grains and phytolith residue from groundstone artifacts. This talk is an expansion of a presentation I recently gave in a colloquium at the AIA conference in New Orleans that was organized by Dr. Alatus Van de Mortel, and it focused on utilizing practice theory to interpret the archaeological record at the site of Nitru. <coughs> 
in archaeological language, we talk regularly about subsistence practices at the temporal, site, and cultural level. In most contexts, the terminology is simply used to discuss what foods have been utilized at a given archaeological site. It is much more difficult, however, to extract information on the long-term societal practices involved in the processing of food and in the consumption of resources from the archaeological record. In this talk, which presents the results of a pilot study of starch grains and phytoliths from groundstone artifacts, I attempt to expand on the concept of subsistence practices by examining how the actual practices of food processing are related more broadly to what Joyce and Lapaparo describe as the intentional actions of past agents working within the structures they inhabited. Giddens describes structuration as formed through reflexive practice. As such, structuration encompasses both stability and change within society. Because food selection and preparation are deeply embedded within cultural systems, how these practices survive and change through time provide insight into individual and collective agency and their impact on societal trends and values. In order to provide you with an understanding of how starch grains and phytoliths can inform on practice, I've divided this talk into four parts. I will begin by explaining how microbotanical analysis can contribute to archaeological research and how this methodology, which is still fairly new to the Aegean, differs from macrobotanical analysis, which is much more commonly utilized. I'll then describe briefly um, what are starch grains and phytoliths, including the types of vegetation that produce these microbotanicals, the morphotypes that are relevant to the current study, and the methods used for extraction. This background will give you an idea of the applicability of the methodology to archaeological research. I will then move on to how I have employed microbotanical analysis at the site of Mitru and how this work has contributed to broadening our interpretation of subsistence practices at the site. I'll conclude briefly with uh, the directions for future research and I'll provide you with some practical knowledge about how you can incorporate these methodologies into your own research projects. So on to part one. Most subsistence studies in the Aegean to date have relied on the identification of macrobotanical remains to reconstruct diet at a site level. This type of reconstruction provides us with an understanding of the foods present on the site, but it is heavily dependent on specific circumstances of preservation, and it does not inform us directly about food processing or consumption. Preservation of macrobotanicals is highly dependent on charring. So identification of the plants utilized at a site based solely on this method rely on material being preserved through destruction events or as a result of the use of burning in plant processing. Reconstructions are also often based on the materials found in large storage, storage contexts. Although these remains indicate the presence of these foods and certainly suggest their consumption on a site, in a society where trade and exchange are so prominent the actual extent to which these resources are utilized at a site level does not necessarily correlate with the resources stored. Similarly, knowing the resources present at a site does not always give us insight into the consumption of these resources. And, as we know from our modern society, resource consumption can vary within and between society, a pattern difficult to reconstruct based on macrobotanical remains. The analysis of microbotanical remains extracted from groundstone tools, in this case, or potentially other artifacts, provides an avenue to look more directly at subsistence practices at a refined scale. Because the reconstruction of subsistence is linked to a particular artifact found in a specific context, the results tell us a more direct story of the consumption practices at a site. And here, this is for the Canadians that probably aren't watching in Edmonton. We have our little Tim Hortons icon. Um, so, what are these microbotanicals? Starch grains and phytoliths are both microscopic particles produced, uh, produced within plants. 
starch grains are the energy reserves or carbohydrates of a plant. There are two types of starch grains, transitory and storage. Transitory starch grains are produced during photosynthesis, uh, primarily in the leaves of the plant. They are consumed almost immediately by the plant, and they are small, they are pretty much similar between species, and really they're of very little interest to us. Storage starch grains, on the other hand, are of interest, both as consumers and as archaeologists, since these are produced in the part of the plant that we eat. In the normal life cycle of a plant, these starches would eventually be used by the plant for flowering or reproduction. Fortunately, we have enzymes in our stomach that help us to actually uh, utilize and break down these starches for our own energy, despite the fact that they are semi-crystalline in nature. When we consume the plant parts, we are basically utilizing the plant's energy to meet our own energy needs. The semi-crystalline characteristic of a starch grain makes them useful archaeologically because it allows them to preserve in the archaeological record over very long periods of time. And just to give you an idea, starches have been found that date over 30,000 years old from groundstone tools in Europe. So they are definitely around for a very long time. Starch grains can be used, can be identified to genus and sometimes to species based on a suite of specific morphological features. These include whether the starches are uh, individually formed or whether they're formed as aggregates or groups. The shape is also informative. They can be polygonal, lenticular, they can be um, bean shaped or, or oval. Uh, they can also be differentiated based on the surface texture. In addition, they have a feature called a helum, which is basically where the uh, starch originally grows out of, and this can be uh, open or closed, so you can either see it or you can't. Um, they also, it can be located in the center or, or eccentrically located. Starches also have growth rings. Um, that you sometimes can see and you sometimes can't, depending on the, the species and these rings vary in thickness. So there's a bunch of morphological characteristics. There's two more that are really important, and that is this extinction cross, which occurs because of the semi-crystalline nature. And this originates at the location of the helum, so it can tell you whether the helum is eccentric or centric. Um, the extinction cross also has legs, what we call legs. And these can curve, they can be thick, they can be thin, you can have multiple, multiple arms. Um, and also starches sometimes have fissures in them, and the shape of the fissure um, and the general location could be informative. So we can use all of these morphological characteristics to help figure out what types of plants are present. Okay, so now not all plants that we consume uh, produce starch grains. Uh, some plants store their starches in, convert their starches into oil or sugar. And things like olive, fig, and grape unfortunately do not produce starch grains. So for those of you who are thinking this is this great method that I'm going to be able to apply all over the Aegean and answer these wonderful broad questions, unfortunately uh, we cannot identify these particular plants. But do not lose hope. <laughs> there are plants that we can identify. Um, high starch producers include the roots and tubers of many plants, as well as grasses or grain seeds, and the pulses as well. One of the objectives of my research here is to develop a robust comparative collection for this region, which has not yet been done. And there are many plants that we don't know whether or not they produce diagnostic starches. So things such as uh, salep, sedge knot, um, carob, uh, coriander, things that could have easily been ut utilized and may produce diagnostic forms. That's just to name a few. What we do know so far, based on both what we have as a comparative collection at the Wiener Lab um, since I've been here, and uh, based on published literature, is that wheat and barley both produce diagnostic starch grains. These are basically round in plan view and lenticular in profile view. They are differentiated one from the other based on the presence of dimples, and you can see these uh, little dimples here, on the wheat starch grain and lamellae, 
which you can see here on the uh, barley starch grain. Um, the barley starch grain also has some surface depressions. Legumes produce diagnostic starch grains that are bean shaped or reniform in shape. They have lamella, a centric helum, and multi leg extinction crosses. Unique features do appear to exist uh, that could be used to differentiate the types of legumes, such as chickpea, bitter vetch, bitter vetch and fava, but these characteristics have really yet to be defined. Other starchy foods, like roots and tubers, produce diagnostic forms. These are generally more elongated in shape. They have an eccentric helum. Few roots or tubers, as I said, have been uh, examined in the Mediterranean. This picture is of sedge nut, but this is from a North American sedge nut, so we're not sure whether the form would be the same. Um, so this is, again, an avenue that needs to be pursued more. So phytoliths, the other microbotanical of interest, um, phytoliths differ from starch grains in several ways. They're composed of silica, which is absorbed in the form of an amorphous liquid through the roots of the plant, and it precipitates out into the plant's cell. Phytoliths, like starches, preserve over long periods of time, uh, and in fact, even longer than starch grains. So the oldest uh, phytoliths are 70 million years old, and they come from uh, dinosaur dung. Um, and so you can see here in this image, you have the silica coming up into the cells. It's absorbed as the plant dies. This is basically a rock in the shape of the cell. Obviously, it's not this boring and square. You'll see some pictures that are much more interesting. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the precipitation of silica in a plant is genetically controlled. And some plants, such as the grasses, produce lots of phytoliths, while others don't produce any at all. Because plants have multiple types of cells, in phytolith producing plants, the morphotypes produced could vary, and in some cases they can be indicative of specific plant parts. For economic and edible plants, the actual seeds may not contain phytoliths, but the outer protective surface may, and that is basically what's enclosing the edible portion. This is an important distinction between starches and phytoliths, and it'll come up later in the talk when I'm talking about the Mitru data. So, uh, how do we differentiate the phytoliths? Uh, wheat and barley phytoliths can be differentiated. They're generally differentiated based on the curve wave of the dendrof dendroform inflorescent form, with wheat having a rounded edge and barley having a more square topped edge. Other edible grasses, such as millet, rye, and rice, also produce diagnostic forms, but since none of these were identified at Mitru, I'm not going to discuss how they're recognized, but if you're interested in this type of work on archaeological sites, it's worth remembering that these additional grasses can be differentiated. Similarly, uh, sedges, palms, and reeds can also be identified through uh, phytolith analysis, and again, I won't be more specific than that about the morphotypes. So in addition to identifying the plants I just discussed, we can also get some information on plant processing based on the condition of the microbotanicals. Specifically, evidence of exposure to eat, heat impacts both starches and phytoliths. Starch grains, when exposed to lower moderate temperatures for short durations, change their morphology. Uh, exposure to higher temperatures or over longer durations actually causes complete gelatinization, at which point the diagnostic features are, are gone and the brain is no longer identifiable. Studies have been conducted to document these changes, and I'm also incorporating these types of studies into the building of the comparative collection at the Wiener Lab. Um, and one of the things that you can see is a change um, in the presence of lamellae that develop uh, when wheat is subjected to 10 minutes of boiling, you can see the grain kind of gets a little deformed and you start to get lamellae, which makes it really difficult once it's heat treated to differentiate barley and wheat. <laughs> um, other things that have been identified as causing damage to starch grains are grinding, which can cause this scooped appearance in the center of the grain, and furrowing, which results from fermentation. And this has been documented in maize, but uh, no studies 
have been done to document what happens to the grains uh, in this region when they've been subjected to grinding or when they've been subjected to um, uh, fermentation. And that's, again, something that could really contribute to our knowledge of, of practice. Uh, finalists, evidence of heat treatment can also be identified on phytoliths. They can, uh, the carbon that's often held within them can be, become occluded when they've been subjected to fire. You can get discoloration and their refractive index can also change. So, we know what these microbotanicals are right now. How do we actually extract them? <clears throat> They are produced in high quantities on the order of millions per gram. And so during the processing of plant material, they can become embedded within the pores of an artifact. Tools used for grinding are often particularly good candidates for containing embedded microbotanicals because they are porous or coarse surfaced. Um, specifically, things like basalt or sandstone are often used to make groundstone tools. For sampling, ideally you'll have an artifact that has been unwashed uh, because the particles are preserved within crevices, though you can have success extracting microbotanicals from washed material as well. For unwashed artifacts, an initial surface wash is conducted using a toothbrush and distilled water. The effluent is saved and the artifact is then placed in distilled water in an ultrasonic bath where the sound waves work to loosen the embedded botanicals. For larger artifacts, a mechanical toothbrush can be used to brush into the deeper crevices. The water from this step consists of a mix of residual dirt and the microbotanicals. This is then separated out using a heavy density liquid um, where the starch grains and the phytoliths float. Um, they have different densities and you extract them, you mount them on a microscope slide, and you can begin examining them. So now I'll turn to Mitru and what we've learned from looking at these microbotanicals. And I'm gonna start off with a brief background on the archeology span of Mitru before I talk about the microbotanical results. So Mitru is a small, tall, tidal islet in East Locris on the North Euboean Gulf. The site was excavated between 2004 and 2008 as a synergosia between the 14th effort of prehistoric and classical antiquities at Lamia and the University of Tennessee under the co-direction of Dr. Zeleni Zahu and Aleda Van de Mortel. Mitru contains an uninterrupted sequence of occupational strata from the early Bronze Age at approximately 2400 BC to the early Iron Age at approximately 900 BC. Through its multi-period occupation, Mitru underwent several socio-political transitions. The earliest occupation of the site dates to EH2B and is characterized by the presence of two structures with thick walls, building N and building M, uh, and with ceramic tiles. This period corresponds to the corridor house tradition which in mainland Greece is considered to have been a period that witnessed the emergence of social stratification and increased centralization. Although not fully excavated, the presence of these thick walled structures <coughs> accompanied by the ceramic tiles at Mitru suggests the site exhibited cultural elements consistent with the broader pattern of increased complexity witnessed throughout the mainland during this period. In EH3 through the Middle Helladic, the archeological evidence shows the return to a simple settlement. Partial excavation of middle Helladic buildings L and K, L and K, and O, which is not pictured here, demonstrate that structures <coughs> during this period are small and the houses have earthen floors. And you can see this is from Carcanus and Van der You can see the earthen floors. Middle Helladic burials were intramural and were made in small cysts, pits, or pithos graves with few or no grave goods. <coughs> Again, Mitru's development during this time period resembles other simple middle Helladic settlements, which are thought to have been fairly egalitarian. In the course of the late Helladic I phase, the character of the settlement at Mitru changes significantly, and these changes mark the emergence of a more complex society with a distinct political elite class. <coughs> 
two large architectural complexes with elite characteristics, Building D, which is this big structure, and this is also part of the complex, um, shown here, were identified the date to the pre-palatial period. Building F, and you can see part of the complex here, which also has characteristics indicative of an elite structure, dates to LH2B. Van de Mortel and Zahu interpret the nature of the site between LH1 and LH2B as indicative of a more organized settlement with urban characteristics. At the end of LH2B in, early, in LH3A2 early, Mitru experiences a destruction event and the elite structures are no longer maintained. Van de Mortel and Zahu propose that the site during this following palatial period, LH3A2 through LH3B, is possibly under the control of Orkomenos, which is right here, though it's not super clear. There's Mitru. The site is briefly rebuilt during LH3C early, after the fall of the palaces, with Building B constructed above the remnants of Building D. And this is Building B right here. <coughs> Based on the location of the rebuilding on top of the pre-palatial structures, this is interpreted as a revival of the site rather than a restructuring. The urban nature of the site, however, does not last long. And by LH3C late and into the proto-geometric period, Mitru is considered to return to a rural society. During the middle proto-geometric, there is minor evidence for low-level social stratification in the form of building A, uh, which may have been a leader's dwelling. So for the preliminary microbotanical study, brownstone artifacts were, were selected from secure contexts that span these occupation periods. The periods missing from this analysis include the middle holotic two middle to middle holotic three, LH3A2 middle to LH3B2 early, and the early proto-geometric. These time periods either did not have groundstone artifacts um, that were utilized for food processing, or they um, did not have artifacts from secure contexts. The starch grains and phytolith results provide a mixed record of brain processing through time. While well, phytolith evidence for wheat processing is present throughout all periods, few wheat starch grains were present on the groundstone tools from the early and middle holotic context. The one exception to this pattern is the identification of wheat starch grains from a single sample in EH2B related to building N. Wheat starch grains are more common on the tools beginning in the late Palatic period and throughout the proto-geometric period. Barley starch grains, or barley phytoliths, sorry, on the other hand, <coughs> are present on several of the early and middle Palatic tools, but are absent from the late Palatic samples. Barley starch grains are present in all periods. It is worth noting, however, that barley starch grains were more common in the early through middle holotic samples than in the late holotic samples. The diversity of plants processed also varied between the assemblages. Unique starch morphotypes were documented on all groundstone artifacts. However, the number of unique forms was lowest in samples dating from LH1 through LH2 periods, and highest in the single sample dating to LH3C. A high number of unique unidentified types were also observed in the LH3 to MH samples. Of these unidentified starch grains, several of them have characteristics suggesting that they are produced in an as yet to be identified root or tuber. Legume starch grains, were identified in two samples, one dating to LH3B2 late and one dating to LH3C. Evidence of burning was identified throughout all periods on many of the dendroform phytoliths, which contained either occluded carbon or discoloration. Heat treatment of starch grains was identified on one sample dating to LH3B2 late. Although difficult to determine the origin of the majority of the heat-treated starch grains, which I mentioned earlier is because of the changes in morphology, a dimpled surface characteristic of wheat 
starch was identifiable on one of the heat-treated grains, suggesting that wheat, at least, was definitely processed in this manner. So I'll turn now to the discussion. Although preliminary and based on a limited sample size, these results provide some insight into the possible relationship between food choice, processing, and changing Bronze Age society. Several aspects of the results can be, as, can be elaborated <coughs> upon, including evidence for grain processing practices, the changes in the prominence of wheat and barley between the early Helladic, middle Helladic, and late Helladic periods, increases in unidentified starch grains during LH3C, evidence for heat treatment, and the presence of legumes during LH3B2 late and LH3C, as well as the likely processing of roots or tubers. <clears throat> Although the samples contain evidence for wheat and barley processing during all temporal periods, a result that correlates with the macrobotanical data from the site, it seems that there's a difference in the pattern or extent of processing between the cereals through time. In order to understand this, we need to remember the location in the plant where the microbotanicals are produced, which I discussed earlier. The phytoliths are being produced in the gloom or outer bract of the seed. Their presence on the groundstone tools indicates that chafe or bract was present when the grain was being processed. Although we can't differentiate between the specific species of wheat, i.e. whether we had icorn or emer or bread wheat, or the specific barley types, three row or six row, with this analysis, the types of grains identified at the site in the macrobotanical analysis, which was conducted by Karen Thanu, show that both wheat and barley were of the hulled variety, namely icorn wheat and hulled barley. This means that they have an outer bract that adheres to the grain and needs to be removed prior to consumption. Pounding of the grain in order to loosen the seed from the chafe is one of the steps in pre-processing. Even if already dehulled, the presence of a few gloom phytoliths would be expected based on some bracts adhering to the seed. However, these seed bract phytolith forms are fairly common throughout all periods in the Mitru sample. And it is possible that one of the primary uses of the groundstone tools was to pound both wheat and barley to remove the hull. After pounding the seeds, or after pounding, seeds are often winnowed and then go to another step of processing and they can either be stored as whole grains, they can be cooked as whole grains, <coughs> or they can be further processed. Unlike the phytoliths, starch grains are produced in the actual seed, when the seed itself is being ground to make either flour or bulgur, the starch grains are getting released. In this case, we are looking at this further step in cereal processing. I would argue that throughout all time periods, the groundstone tools are being used in the pounding process to remove the seed bracts, but that there is a diachronic difference in the way in which grains are further processed. While barley seems to have been processed further throughout all periods, additional processing of wheat, as indicated by starch grains, appears to be associated with periods of greater social complexity and or elite structures at the site. Whereas barley starch grains occur in most periods, wheat starch grains were identified in the EH2B corridor house period, the LH prepalatial and palatial periods, and associated with building A, the potential leader's dwelling, in the protogeometric period. The correlation of increased wheat processing to greater complexity and or elite structures during chronologically separate periods supports not only a correlation between an emerging elite society and subsistence choices, but the possible perception of wheat in the ground form as a higher value crop. This perception appears to not only be enduring, but to be reinforced by the elite through practice in the form of grain processing for food consumption. When Mitru witnesses a return to a rural occupation during LH3C late and into the protogeometric period, there is some evidence for a transition in the practice of food processing. Specifically, the LH3C sample contained a much higher number of unidentified but possibly diagnostic starch grains, 
suggesting that a diversity of plants were being processed on this corn. This diversity may reflect the reliance on and need for long-term storage of produce grown within household garden plots. These results suggest that subsistence practices shifted to the individual or household level. Interestingly, the number of unidentified types was also high in the Middle Helladic period, another time when people may have relied more heavily on locally produced resources. <coughs> the identification for heat treatment of grains provides additional insight into processing practices at the site. The burning identified on the Denver form phytolus provides specific evidence for the practice of exposure to fire as a component of pre-processing. Parching is one method of pre-processing that may have been utilized as part of the dehulling process. Um, ethnographic studies recently have suggested that parching isn't actually necessary for pre-processing. However, it still may be utilized to facilitate the removal of the hull from the seed. The practice of parching grains identified here appears to have been employed throughout the history of site occupation and represents a long-term collective practice at the site. Evidence for the pretreatment of cereals is also present on the starch grains identified on the palatial groundstone sample. The morphological changes in these grains are consistent with those observed in grains boiled for 10 minutes. Bala Modi, who also identified boiled and ground grains in a prehistoric northern Greece macrobotanical assemblage, proposes that this practice is similar to the modern method of making bulgur. Bulgur is cereal that has been boiled dried, debranded, and ground. Bulgur has several advantages, including an increased nutritional value, quick cooking time and after pre-processing, and a hardened texture which discourages insects. Unlike the evidence for parching observed in the phytolith record, at, presidents, at present the evidence for boiling has only been identified in the LH3B2 late sample. Two other aspects the microbotanical results are worth noting. The first is the presence of pea and legume starch grains on the palatial and post-palatial groundstone artifacts. This indicates that these pulses are being used in a flower form. The second is the presence of several starch forms throughout all time periods that have characteristics indicative of roots or tubers. Although these forms are unidentified at present, it demonstrates that with improvement to the comparative collection, uh, we will be able to identify a greater diversity of plants utilized through the Bronze Age. So to summarize the Mitru data and to return to practice theory, the microbotanical analysis of groundstone artifacts at Mitru provides insight into multiple scales of practice through time and at an individual, collective, and societal level. Based on Reckwitz's definition of practice as a routine behavior that incorporates physical and mental action, the use of things, and background knowledge, grain processing is by its very nature grounded in practice. The general processes of heat treatment and hull removal is part of an enduring history of practice at Andrew. Outside of this habitus, we also find in the data evidence of what we might call elite agency, which impacts practice during the corridor house pre-palatial and palatial periods, when the preferences of the elite direct the additional processing of wheat. Finally, with the decline of the elite and the return to a rural society, the choices of subsistence processing falls to individual and household agents. So on that note, I would like to conclude by taking a bit of time to talk about research questions that can be addressed through this type of analysis and the types of artifacts that can be examined for microbotanicals, and then I'll also discuss the directions that I'm taking with my future research. And so this is for those of you who are actually um, thinking about what you might be able to find out on your own sites by incorporating this methodology. There is significant interest uh, in incorporating starch grain phytolith analysis from ceramic vessels. Um, whereas groundstone analysis is limited to identifying foods that were actually processed by ground by grinding, an analysis of starches and phytoliths extracted from ceramic vessels can inform on the broader breadth of uh, broader breadth of the diet during during the use of that particular artifact.
Um, this type of anal analysis can also help to shed light on uh, vessel form versus function. And one thing that's important to remember when you're thinking about sampling for this type of artifact is that heat does impact starches, and so focusing on uh, shirts that are either from the body or the rim may provide better results. Uh, starches and phytoliths can also be extracted from flaked stone artifacts. I did some preliminary processing of um, sickles at Meat True, and they had been washed, so the recovery was actually kind of small um, or limited. However, there was an indication that dendroform phytoliths, those from the seed racks, and uh, were present on these artifacts. However, I couldn't differentiate the types of grains that had been, um, had actually, they'd been used on. Um, if this were employed, though, on unwashed tools, it could provide an indication of what crops were actually being um, grown and cultivated locally, which would be really interesting. Uh, finally, dental calculus is a very interesting source for starch grain and phytolith analysis. Um, you can find out specific information on the diet of individuals, which can help you to differentiate um, di to help you to differentiate between groups within a society and their access to different food resources, etc. Um, back to our Canadian influence, my dental calculus would show a lack of time for cooking and a love of honey coolers. Um, <laughs> So for my own research, what I'm going to be doing over the next few years to, to finalize is um, I will be continuing to expand on the analysis of the Mitru groundstone. I will also be analyzing some of the ceramics at the site. Uh, one of the primary goals um, is to also include additional Bronze Age sites in this study. I'm targeting Tiran's, Pilos, Elion, and Sungiza for that component of the work. I'm also focusing on expanding the comparative collection at the Wiener Lab, specifically looking at roots and tubers. I'm interested in also looking at plants that may have been used for fragrances or for spices. Um, we've been considering looking at that on posts especially. Um, and I'd also like to focus on the impacts of different processing methods as well. So to conclude, I will just say that although Mitru was a pilot study, it really demonstrates the ability of microbotanicals for contributing to our archaeological interpretations. Uh, the analysis of additional groundstone from the site may provide support for the interpretations that I've made here. Uh, it, they may also disprove them or result in their modification. But in either case, it's clear that uh, incorporating starch and phytolith and microbotanical methodology can really provide us with a deeper understanding of subsistence practices throughout the Bronze Age. Thank you. Good. I was going to take them without your permission. <laughs> any questions, any comments, observations? Um, so, what you really have to do is work with a lot of different people <laughs> who, I mean, the way archaeologists uh, slice and dice their uh, finds is not necessarily uh, related to, uh, uh, to the kind of topics you're, you're, you're driving at, in, in the sense of the strong people do one thing, the groundstone people do another, yeah. the chipstone. Etc. And then the paleobotanical people mm -hmm. usually not not as you pointed out. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's nice to be able though to get a broader picture, a fuller picture of um, what's actually going on at a site level, at an individual level, as opposed to just looking at um, you know these are the foods that were there. Um, because we can get a lot more information if we can uh, focus um, at a different scale uh, on what was actually being done with these food resources. And that can help us to talk about things like 
um, besides differences within the society, but also things about trade, you know, where are the foods coming, where are they going, what are they eating at home versus what are they shipping out um, to other areas. So there's a lot um, more questions that can be addressed um, when we take these, apply these methodologies. Um, I have a concern from, about, uh, is there any data uh, on how different soil types influence the preservation of starches and also berry versus surface finds? Um, there's definitely preservation, um, there's more, way more work done on preservation of phytoliths than with starches, and basic soils are problematic to, um, to phytoliths, but not to the extent that they aren't well preserved with the trees. Um, and starches, um, there is a problem with, um, I, I've had success with it, the extraction, but um, more acidic uh, environments can be problematic. And actually, any pH that's <laughs> leads in one direction or another, they're definitely more fragile than phytoliths. Um, I can't think of any, there, there have been some studies, but I can't think of them specifically right now, which ones have been informative regarding soil. For the groundstone artifacts and looking at um, the material culture, uh, there's concerns with things having been acid treated. Um, if you're looking at old, old uh, assemblages. Um, but because the sonicator gets in, removes the particles that are embedded in the pores, you can actually still have material preserved. And I've had to resort to using acid just to get to the stone tool, the used surface of the stone tool, right? I mean, it's there. some of these things are so encrusted in the nature itself. You said that the matter of the time for the answer, you two were, half of them, oh, some of them were burned, uh -huh. some of them were not, right? The microbotanical for the phytoliths from the ground stone, um, the bulk of the dendroforms were burned, and I had one of the reasons that I felt comfortable also um, that it was due to the processing mm -hmm. of the um, Part, potential parching was because there were phytoliths that were not burned, that were not from seed bracts, and I think those were part of just the contaminate. So I would have, you know, a long, long cells or, um, you know, some short cells that weren't at all related to grain processing or like a, like a chloridoids or mm -hmm. that I felt that were completely unburned, and in fact most were. And then I'd have dendroform forms that were because I, I would like to ask if uh, you can see any, let's say, um, uh, difference also in the rooms where they have been recovered. In you terms of speak, the burning? Yeah, yeah spatial, the, you know, uh, in, yeah, different whether, rooms, or uh, if you can say something about the different types of tools that were used. I, I'm hoping case. to be, if, like, uh, the sample size is really small, but I do think that there's... If I can suggest the context on enough of the artifacts, I think there's a good potential to look at the difference in the tools versus the um, both the phytoliths and the starches that are coming out, and whether you have a difference in tool use uh, or tool type, not specific to uh, grinding like types of horns, not necessarily the marker type, but just the material type of the rock. Um, would be interesting. And then I do think that there's, um, all of these are from context where they're associated with some sort of, of room. So, I mean, we're not necessarily getting uh, information on um, what's going on potentially with different um, social groups within, within each time period. Mm -hmm. And again, the sample size is really limited, and part of that is a problem getting enough material from secure contexts. So. Yes, I have a question. Um, the analysis you get represents the final use of the stone tool or? So the, the thinking is that the um, particles get embedded within the pores and so over the, it's a cumulative 
So if a tool was used for 200 years, then you're exactly. likely to have a cumulative record of that tool's use. But this, at the end, means that your analysis of your dealing with Russian stones might be biased by the long period of use. definitely true that it could be biased by the long period of use, absolutely. Um, if you have a suggestion to get around no, 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 it, I would love to know. Just, just out of curiosity. But I don't know. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, if you figure that these are curated tools, yeah. right, um, then there is that potential for the long period of use. However, I guess I could argue based on this data set that I see enough of the diachronic difference in the starches, for example, mm -hmm. that it doesn't seem like if I had a record, if I actually, I, I think you could say that, because if I had everything that was exactly the same through all of them, then yes, okay, well, they've been utilized. I mean, maybe it's just that a few are, are curated, mm -hmm. but I do see periods of time where I have um, one practice and periods of time where I have another practice, which would lead me to think that I, I am kind of looking at a more refined mm. temporal no, period, but I don't it's, know. It's a fascinating aspect and certainly one would, I'm not a stone tool expert, one would mm -hmm. need the expertise of a stone tool person to tell us how long specific tools might have been used. <laughs> well, that has not, I don't know any stone tool expert who can do that at the moment. Yeah. And a second question, did you see any you change between EB2 and EB3 in what they planted or grounded? Is um, there any trace of a climatic change visible in what you not, can see? Not on what I looked at and, and from what, um, and they're still in the initial stages of the macro botanical mm -hmm. stuff and I haven't, from what I gather they haven't, but I would be kind of speaking prematurely because they haven't finished their results, but I don't see an environmental component to this. You, um, don't, you don't see it, or well, it, the method doesn't allow you to see the it? The method looking on groundstone tools I don't think would okay. allow you to see it, and especially when you have, um, you're dealing with these groups where you don't even know whether these are, they're processing mm -hmm. things that are grown locally or not. I mean, you would need to do a comparison with the soil samples mm -hmm. that have a decent profiles and uh, you know well refined chronology in order to get at the temporal difference um, in terms of what's actually being grown locally and, and changed the time. I, I, soil soils study of them out off site actually in the fields would be the way to probably address that. It, it must work together with looking at pollen too. Yeah, you know. which is uh, I actually also do see quite a bit of pollen, but I don't know how to. I'm not a pollen person, so I don't know. That I mean, ones you get on, on ground stone tools would be pretty stray ones, presumably, but. Yeah, I think you, a lot of them are. Um, when you start looking in soils, that, that's a different matter. Yeah, and I don't. Um, the Studying any of these things in soils is always uh, minus looking at soils on an actual archaeological site. Um, looking off-site at soils requires um, uh, extensive micro-sampling of the soil profile. Um, it, you have, um, because soils are similar to what you were saying about the groundstone too, they're often, often a record of, um, a cumulative record of what's been growing over a long period of time. So unless you have <coughs> cumulative soils or um, you have areas where you have uh, paleosols preserved, between, uh, I might be using language that is not familiar with the group, but unless you have paleosols preserved with um, depositional layers in between, it can be really hard to, do, to refine what's going on in the soils. So. Quick methodological question. You were talking about whether or not <coughs> the, uh, the results of whether stone tools are washed or not. And so for the meter sample, it seems like you have really good results, but yeah. so what proportion was what? I would suspect... None of the meter were washed. None. Oh, okay. Yeah, of the ones that, I, yeah, the latest saved them all to not be washed. And the Tiran samples that I have, I haven't looked at them yet, I have half of the Tiran samples were washed and half of them weren't. So I'll be able to say as soon as I look at them. So what, what would be your advice to, in terms of old excavations? Which, I mean, my assumption would be more objects are washed than not. Oh yeah, and well, and we were talking about this also, the acid uh, bath is 
potentially problematic. Yeah. Uh, and I don't have, I don't know yet. I'll find, I'll let you know as soon as, I, as soon as I look at the Tiran stuff. But the stuff from Tiran's that I'm looking at is not, was never acid bath washed. So mm. I can't, I don't, uh, Pilos has, I'm pretty sure had acid. So we'll see when I get to those. So. Other questions, comments? Um, uh, I, yes. I, yeah, I have uh, kind of a, uh, uh, possible comment to what uh, Walter was uh, saying. I guess that when you talk about um, macro periods, uh, macro macro historical periods, as we were discussing here, so the Middle Atlantic as a rural period, or uh, the H E H to B as a more organized period, and all of the various that have been mentioned. Obviously, I guess you can use the final part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm to kind of balance the rest of it, especially if you have a good sample, I guess that could be a... So the h to b sample some, uh, somehow can be used to date that, and if you have something that is from the LH3 to early destruction, in that case you can use that, I guess, to uh, as a final moment of the prepalatial period, and you can kind of, uh, I guess, use this as... Mm -hmm to re-enter yourself through uh, macro historical period, I guess. I, I have not thought about this before, I mean, but that's the first <laughs> reaction that I could. Oh, one, one thing I think, um, <clears throat> it's probably that food, um, food ways are very conservative, so that um, people, uh, if people would walk a mile for a camel, um, they would uh, probably be resistant to changing their food ways unless it seemed like they had no choice. So that you have this lag, you would be a lag if there's any environmental uh, factors that are causing a change in, uh, in agricultural practice and in crops, people still would try. Mm -hmm. And quite possibly even in organized times, what we might consider as the um, rural kind of diet, there'd be still people uh, who would practice that uh, diet, follow that diet, while the people at the at the upper upper part of the uh, uh, societal spectrum mm -hmm. might well be importing, using things that are um, you know are new and different, right. and then when they no longer can afford support uh, well, pain. We do see. I mean, we're talking about a fairly consistent. We're looking at groundstone tools, which are generally used to grind barley and wheat, right? <laughs> so we're kind of looking at uh, a transition. I, I think that's part of it is being able to say, how are they grinding this? Like, which is the whole point of the practice, right? So, and I don't know whether, I think that those methods do appear to change through time, um, at least based on these results, where, um, you know, people were consuming probably both throughout both that whole range of time, but it doesn't seem like they were processing wheat down to flour throughout the whole time period, or else I would have wheat starches on the tools throughout the whole time period. But it's only certain tools that I'm seeming to get wheat starch grains. Uh, I get the phytolists are in, uh, in the whole range. So I, I think that the I think ceramics might be a little bit more telling in terms of, you know, this broader understanding of how diet might change through time. Um, well, you, you've certainly indicated to us uh, laggards in the uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Aegean Basin, the potential of phytoliths and starches, and it seems clear that uh, certainly sampling strategies and um, uh, the aggregation of information has to change so yeah. that uh, there's much more sharing uh, and awareness of, of the needs. You can be looking for other things yeah. in pottery than uh, stylistic uh, uh, chronologies. And not just chemical residue analysis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Often we go nuclear before we yeah. have to. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Uh,